Okay, great. So hello everybody, thank you for coming today. So today we're happy to have the honor to introduce you today to Dr. Marina Bedney. We have selected her to be our distinguished lecturer in our title. So this lecture series here is hosted at Gallaudet University and it's hosted by the PhD in Educational Neuroscience program. So today, we're especially thrilled to have Dr. Bedney accept our invitation to become our distinguished lecturer. So Dr. Bedney is an assistant professor in the Psychological and Brain Sciences Department at John Hopkins University. She got her bachelor's university, or her got her bachelor's degree from Johns Hopkins University, and, and her master's degree, or PhD from Pennsylvania University, and conducted her postdoctoral training at MIT under Professor Rebecca Sachs. So Dr. Bedney's is well known in the field of cognitive neuroscience because of her discoveries about time course and the mechanics behind cortical plasticity in development. Specifically, she studies different human experiences to understand how biology, genes in specific, and environment expertise influence each other, and how that relationship impacts cortical function during development. So we see rich connections between our work here in educational neuroscience and Dr. Bedney's work analyzing variations of experience and how they impact the brain underlying higher cognition, particularly learning. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bedney as our 2016 Distinguished Lecturer. Her title is Biology and Environment in Neurocognitive Development discoveries from studying blindness. So thank you again, and really we're happy and honored to have you here today. Keep 
going. Okay, great. So um, one of the things that my lab does is um, take advantage of variation in human experience. Um, and by comparing uh, cognition and neuroscience in people who grow up in different ways, we hope to learn about kind of the core things that make us human um, and make our brains work the way that they do. So that's kind of the approach we take. Um, a big direction in my lab, a big direction of research, is comparing the minds and brains of people who grow up with vision and those people who grow up without vision, so people who are um, blind. Um, and so we'll, I'll be talking to you about some work we've done in individuals who are blind from birth. And then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about data from individuals who became blind later in their life, and also um, children who are, who are blind. Okay. Um, so one of the questions that um, often comes up is why study blindness? What, what, what can blindness tell us? Um, and the reason that I study blindness is that human experience varies in all sorts of very complicated and uncontrolled ways. Some people learn music, some people don't, some people grow up with three siblings, some people grow up with none, and it's all kind of difficult to study and control. Um, and blindness is a kind of experience that we know something about, um, and so um, it gives us a handle uh, on, on addressing these research questions. And there are interesting things we can ask um, uh, for two reasons. One is that vision is a major source of information for humans and also for primates in general. And so one of the things we can ask, and that'll be the first part of my talk, is how does our conceptual system, so the concepts that we have of actions, objects, categories develop when we learn about things not through vision but through other means. Um, there are some interesting theories in cognitive psychology that put vision as a really important source of information. And the question is, does it matter how you learn things for how they're represented? Um, Another reason why um, blindness is a really interesting kind of experience to study is that a large part of the brain um, in humans, and again in primates, in general is devoted to visual perception. So depending on whether you ask a vision scientist or a language scientist, you might get something like a quarter of the brain or a fifth of the brain, but it's a really large developed part of the brain, evolutionarily developed. And what we can ask is what happens to this very large part of the cortex when it doesn't get its species typical input, so it doesn't get any visual input. What new functions does it take on as a window into how experience shapes um, brain development? So um, I'm going to talk about two questions today. One is how does nature and nurture shape neurocognitive development, and by that I mean conceptual development. And then the next question I'm going to ask is how tightly innate neural structure constraints function. So that'll be the second part of the talk. So first, how does nature and nurture shape neurocognitive development? Um, this is an old question that people have asked that I think has been revived um, uh, a little bit in, in recent years in terms of the relationship between sensory experience and our concepts. Um, so what, what we want to know is to what degree are our concepts grounded in our sensory experiences, and in this case in particular, visual experience. And the way that I'm going to try to approach this problem is by looking at visual concepts in people who are blind, so concepts of seeing and light in individuals who don't have first-hand experience of these concepts. In particular, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the meanings of visual verbs, and then a little bit about interpretations of stories that talk about seeing. Okay, right. Um, so this work traditionally um, is grounded in the seminal findings um, that you might all be familiar with um, of uh, Landau and Gleitman looking at cognition um, in uh, several blind children and documenting their acquisition of words like look and see and also of spatial terms. And so we, were, we wanted to take this question a step further and ask, what do blind individuals know about visual verbs? Um, and this is related to um, kind of modern ideas about embodiment, right? So this idea that really the way you represent your concepts, maybe even abstract concepts, is by decomposing them to sensory components that your firsthand sensory experience really plays a major role in representing these concepts. And really blindness and the concepts of light and, and vision in blind individuals are a strong test of that hypothesis. So what we did is we studied uh, visual verbs um, in individuals who are blind. These are people who are um, congenitally uh, blind from birth. Um, and we asked what they know about visual verbs like glimpse, look, peek, glance, gaze, and scan, um, as well as light verbs like bl um, blaze, flare, glitter, glow, and shimmer. 
Um, and then we compared them to some conceptual categories that you wouldn't expect would be any different in people who are blind. So for example, touch verbs like grip, um, rub, and prod, um, and also amodal verbs like admire, appreciate, and discover. And so the question is, are blind individuals' concepts of these visual verbs any different from the cited? So um, at this point, I'm going to take a pause and tell you a little bit about the population of participants that we work with. Um, so uh, the blind community is a really heterogeneous population. Most people who are blind actually have some vision, um, even though their vision is functionally impaired. But the people that we work with are a small subset of that community. So the individuals we work with are people who are totally blind with at most minimal light perception. They're blind due to some problem with their eyes or optic nerves, so not due to damage to the visual cortex since we're studying the brain. These are individuals who have um, no cognitive or neurological disabilities. It's a very heterogeneous population. We have you know, people who are attorneys, people who are stay-at-home moms, um, various ages. The age range is um, rather wide from 19-year-olds you know, to 65-year-olds. So it's a, it's a um, heterogeneous sample in, in that sense. Um, if you want to know more about um, what kinds of conditions, eye conditions these individuals have, I can tell you more about those details. Um, later on, but uh, the, the general idea is that um, it's a problem with the retina in, in, in all of these individuals or the optic nerve. Um, and so for this study, and in general, for most of the work that I'll tell you about, I'm going to compare um, the performance or the neur neural responses in individuals who are blind to individuals who are sighted who are age and education matched um, to the participants who are blind. In this study, we also had a second control group, um, which, which is not really a control group, but a reference group of sighted college students, okay? And they'll become clear why. Okay, so what we did in this study is we asked um, blind and sighted participants to read the semantic similarity of a large um, well, 14 verbs in each category. So we paired all the verbs with each other. So people would rate how similar is glimpse and look, how similar is glimpse and spot, how similar is glimpse and stare in random order, right? And we also paired them with touch verbs like glimpse and touch, glimpse and feel, right? Um, participants completed these surveys online. Um, they would log in, they would do a little bit, and they would go about their day, and then they would log back in. It took over eight hours to complete the whole survey, so that's why um, they, they did this in the convenience of their home. And blind individuals um, completed these surveys online using screen readers, um, which read the text on the screen to, to a blind person. Okay. Um, and so what you can do when you collect these kind of semantic similarity rate, um, ratings is you get a semantic similarity matrix. And what that matrix contains is the relative similarity of all the verbs to each other. So some verbs um, across participants are going to be really similar, um, like maybe peak and glimpse, and some verbs are going to be really different. Um, and so this gives you a similarity structure, and we get one such matrix per person. And then we average the matrices together to get a group-wise matrix. We get one group-wise matrix for our sighted participants and one group-wise matrix for our blind participants. And this is kind of a rich source of data to ask, what are these concepts like in this population? And so one of the things that we did to try to get a handle of how much do blind individuals know or what do they know about these verbs is we asked, OK, well, for the visual verbs, how similar are the ratings of the visual verbs in between two groups of sighted participants, and what about between a group of sighted participants and a group of blind participants? So in other words, is it that two groups of sighted people are more similar to each other than a group of blind people and a group of sighted people? Um, so this is the correlation between the data for visual verbs, between the, the reference group of college students and an older group of sighted controls uh, matched to the blind participants. And you see the ratings are reliable. They're pretty highly correlated. The R squared is 0.69. And when you look at the data comparing blind and sighted individuals to each other, they're equally correlated. So basically what you get is that as far as this technique is concerned, blind people know everything there is to know about these verbs. There's nothing. Um, the, the, the ratings of two groups of sighted people are just as similar as the ratings of, of a group of blind and sighted people. Um, one thing we wanted to know was what about relative to other categories of verbs? So these, this is the um, correlation between um, two sighted people, so, so sorry, a sighted person to the group of blind people 
and a blind person to the group of sighted people. So basically, one after the next. Um, we do this leave one out procedure to ask how similar are the sighted people to each other, and then how similar are blind people to sighted people um, for different categories of verbs, for the emotal verbs, for the touch verbs, and for the visual verbs. And so um, in the dark colors, you see the blind to sighted data, and in the light colors, you see the sighted to sighted correlations. And what you see is that across the board, both for the amodal, touch, and visual verbs, blind and sighted people are equally similar to each other. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the touch verbs or the visual verbs. The ratings across the groups are similar. Um, this is just a quick glimpse um, using a dendrogram uh, clustering analysis to ask what do blind people know about these verbs. And so some of the kind of information that blind people know is that they know um, which of the looking verbs are brief. Um, and which are persistent. Um, so they distinguish between things like staring and gawking versus things like glancing and glimpsing. And I can tell you more about the richness of the kind of information that's contained in these similarity matrices. Um, so what that kind of behavioral data suggests to us is that these kinds of concepts that have, some people have thought of as sensory um, are really not sensory at all because you don't need first person experience to know these meanings. Um, one thing that comes up uh, for these kinds of data is, well, it's possible that blind people kind of know the, how to use the words, but they're not really thinking about them in, this, in the same way. So how do you get out of this? Maybe they're just kind of talking the talk, but they're not using the same cognitive or neural mechanisms to think about them. So here briefly, I'm just showing you data, um, neural data um, from an analogous kind of task where we asked, how do blind individuals reason about sighted people's seeing experiences? So in this experiment, um, blind and sighted participants got stories about characters who were either experiencing hearing events, seeing events, or feeling events um, that were all mentalizing theory of mind events. Um, and what we asked was, do blind individuals use similar neural mechanisms to think about other people's seeing experiences as sighted people do? Um, and the answer um, is yes. So these are data from um, the right temporal parietal junction. Um, and what you can see is that the right temporal parietal junction responds more to belief stories, shown in the red and blue, irrespective of whether they are stories of seeing experience or hearing experiences, and more to those kinds of stories than stories about bodily feelings or control stories without mental states in sighted subjects. And you see the same pattern of results in blind individuals. So it's not the case that blind people don't use the same neural machinery to think about seeing experiences. OK. So that was my brief little tour that I'm going to give you um, of uh, uh, neurocognitive development. So what, what we found, and I think this is consistent with other work that we've done and work from other labs, is that concepts are really resistant to first person ex um, changes in sensory experience. So there's lots and lots of evidence that conceptual brain regions in blind individuals develop very similarly to the way they do in sighted individuals. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask is a little bit of posing, right? Um, so the next question is, how tightly does a neural structure um, constrain function? So basically, does a particular brain area have a particular function, or is it extremely flexible? So that's going to be the question. Um, and we're going to ask this question by studying the visual cortex. But first, I want to kind of explain what I mean here. So in a typical adult brain, um, the brain is not a, a mush. It, it's not everything does not do everything. Lashley was wrong. It's not equal potential in an adult brain. So there are different brain regions that do visual perception, somatosensation, numerical processing, linguistic processing. And so one question is why? Right? And intuition, I think, a lot of us have is that um, it's because each brain area is built to do the thing that it's meant to do, like a scissor is built to cut. And so the visual cortex is built to see um, because of its intrinsic physiology. And I think that studying the visual cortex in blind individuals really allows us to ask this question, which is what happens to the visual system in, when an individual doesn't see? So we know that um, V1, for example, um, possesses representations of line orientation. There's a spatial map of the world where things in the central part of the visual field are represented in a different part of the brain than things in the peripheral visual field. So it represents a lot of spatial um, information. What does this part of the brain do in a person who is blind? And so people for a while now have accepted the idea that 
we have cross-modal plasticity, right? So a part of the brain that in a sighted person might do vision, might respond to a, um, audition in a person who is blind. In a deaf individual, the auditory cortex might respond to visual stimuli. Um, so this idea that the modality of a brain region can change is well accepted. But in some sense, people want to preserve this notion that a brain region has a function. So traditionally, in blindness and actually in research on deafness and somatic sensation, in most cases of plasticity, people believe that the intrinsic function of a brain area is preserved. So an example of this, and indeed there's evidence for this idea. So um, area MT, which is a motion processing visual area um, in blind individuals, responds to auditory motion. Um, uh, People have argued that V1 is involved in fine-grained spatial discrimination in a blind individuals, but this time of tactile information instead of visual information. And you're probably um, familiar with studies um, on deafness showing that parts of the auditory cortex that you know, respond to peripheral information, um, typically in the auditory modality, come to respond to peripheral information in the visual modality. So this is the idea that there's some intrinsic functional core. Um, and I actually think some of the work that we and others have been doing recently suggests that the brain is more flexible than we previously believed, and there may be no functional core that is cognitively describable. Um, and so what I think is happening in the visual cortex of congenitally blind individuals um, is that there's evidence that the visual cortex is assuming higher cognitive functions. Um, and in particular, it's assuming functions like language, symbolic number. Um, and I think the reason that this is happening is one, that the brain is highly flexible and the same piece of cortical tissue can do lots of widely varying things, and this is an enabling factor. Um, and two, um, that function is really driven by input during development. So whatever information you feed to a brain area while it's developing, it's going to take on that function. We have some ways to go before we've actually demonstrated this, but this is the working hypothesis that we're, that we're dealing with. And so what I'm going to argue and try to present data for is that in blindness, connectivity from frontal parietal networks causes visual cortex to be taken over by higher cognitive functions. Um, and then if we get to it, if I have time at the end, um, I'll talk about some developmental mechanisms for this plasticity. Okay, so the first experiment that I want to tell you about um, in this line of work was looking at responses to language um, in blind individuals. So congenitally blind participants and sighted controls um, were in an MRI scanner while they were listening to sentences. And in this particular experiment, they would hear a word and had to say whether the word came from the preceding sentence. Um, and in a backward speech control condition, they would hear a sim same sentence backwards and then a short segment of backward speech, and they had to say whether that noise segment came from the previous one. And the thing about backward speech is that it sounds like complete gobbledygook. It has no meaning, it has no um, grammar, it is, is not linguistic at all. So we, it's effectively noise. Um, and so when we compare these two conditions um, in a sighted individual and in a blind individual, so this is the overlap of the two groups, you get classic frontotemporal language regions, um, primarily left lateralized. So you get Broca's area in the frontal lobe um, and lateral temporal cortex, and I'm showing you the left hemisphere, but these effects are, um, are indeed left lateralized. And then if you ask, is there anything active in a blind person that is absent Sorry, anything active in a sighted person that is missing in a blind person for this task. So just to, I think I skipped over this, this is responses to sentences greater than backward speech, so a condition difference, okay? Um, so blind people are not missing anything, right? So when you say, is there anything more active for a sighted group than for a blind group, we don't find anything. There's nothing more active in the sighted. So they have all the frontotemporal language areas. But then if we do the reverse contrast and we ask, is there anything extra that a blind person is activating um, that a sighted person is not, the answer is very different. So these are data from two different experiments using relatively similar um, tasks, but not quite the same. And I'm just showing it to you for the purposes of replication. Um, so these are axial slices, and the back of the head is the one shown in red. Um, and what you can see is these are group by condition interaction effects. 
So we're asking what's more active for the blind than the sighted for sentences greater than backward speech. And what you get in this contrast is um, lateralized activation in ver various parts of the visual system, including V1, but not restricted to V1, in blind people compared to sighted people. So large portions of the visual system are activated by sentences in these congenitally blind participants. And we did a region of interest analysis to ask whether these effects extend into what's classically known as V1, or primary visual cortex. And what you find is that the primary visual cortex of congenitally blind individuals responds much more to sentences than to backward speech across these two experiments. And that's not what you see in the sighted participants. Um, I should say that um, most of our experiments, um, the sighted participants are wearing light exclusion blindfolds, so they're not getting any visual input. In some of the experiments that were done early on, we had blind people, close, uh, sighted people closing their eyes, um, but, but then we switched to having them blindfolded. Okay. So one question that comes up is whether this is due to imagery. Um, so maybe blind individuals are not using their visual cortex to see. Maybe they're using it for spatial processing of kind of like schemas of these sentences. Um, so one of the things we did early on is ask whether these effects are more pronounced for more imageable sentences. And the answer is that that's not the case. So it's not the case that the visual cortex of a blind individual likes a sentence like the ball rolled off the stage and to the right and you know, backwards better than Mary likes democracy, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to care about whether something's imageable. Um, of course, one of the things you want to know is more than, well, does it, this bit part of the brain respond to sentences than backward speech? That's a really wide contrast. There's lots of differences between those two stimuli. Does it really respond to linguistic information? Um, and to do that, we had two intermediate conditions that kind of degrade ling the linguistic aspects of a sentence, right? So one condition had just a bag of words. So the stimulus sounds like Alice, dog, East, eight manners. It's just unconnected words. So it has some semantic content, but it's not connected and no grammar. Um, and we had jabberwocky set sentences um, that, this is going to be hard to translate, that's the Dudmore Pline Slakopotted Kirthways on our Gegger Smoin Creedles. So they're they're, yeah, they're meaningless but grammatical sentences. Um, and so the question is, what we found, what other people have found actually previously um, with these kinds of stimuli is that uh, language regions like sentences best and their activity kind of falls off as the stimulus gets less and less sentence-like as you reduce the linguistic information. Um, so these are data from a left lateral temporal lobe area of sighted individuals um, shown in the corner where you get higher respo highest responses to sentences, intermediate responses to word lists and jabberwocky, and the lowest responses to backward speech. And remarkably, that is what you find in the visual cortex of people who are blind. Highest responses to sentences, intermediate to words and, and um, jabberwocky, and lowest to backward speech. Um, and these effects in an individual who is blind extend into primary visual cortex, and we don't see this in people who are sighted. Okay. So this suggested to us that these in, uh, brain regions are really sensitive to fine-grained linguistic information. Um, but what that kind of study does is it breaks a sentence. So it says, if I degrade a language stimulus, will the, um, part, this brain region respond less to it? So in this other study, what we wanted to know is what if I put a language stimulus on steroids? I make a really complicated sentence. So if we manipulate grammatical complexity, can we drive visual cortex activity up, which is what you find in language areas? Um, so in this experiment, we presented participants um, with pair match sentences, um, some, half of which had grammatical complexity, so they had syntactic movement in them, um, which means basically that um, in a sentence with syntactic movement, you get some information in the beginning of the sentence, and then you have to wait a while and get lots of other information before you can link it to the end and create a unified grammatical structure. Um, so some of the sentences had syntactic movement, a half didn't, and then the control stimulus were lists of non-words. And if you look at the behavioral data for these kinds of sentences, we're asking people to answer comprehension questions about them. And as people have shown before, the more grammatically complex sentences are harder to understand. People are less accurate, and they're slower um, to judge these kinds of sentences. Um, 
Right. And what's interesting about these sentences is that the move and plus move and minus move sentences have nearly identical words and very similar meanings. So they're very closely matched except the grammar. Um, so first what I'm showing you is here is that these are actually data from two participants, but I'll show you group data in a second, and this is what we find in the group, is that in cited individuals, sentences greater than non-words gets you, again, the frontotemporal language regions, and in blind people, it gets you additionally visual cortex. And if we look at activity in that visual cortex area in blind and sighted subjects, in the blind individuals, so this is percent signal change plotted over time, um, the dark red condition is the complex sentences, the light red condition or the pink condition is the less complex sentences and gray is the non-words. So you get, during the time of the sentence, higher responses to the complex sentences than the less complex sentences in blind individuals, but you don't see that in the visual cortex of people who are sighted. Okay, so this to us suggests that this part of the brain is also sensitive to the grammatical complexity of sentences in people who are blind. Um, one of the interesting thing was, things was that those individuals who activate the visual cortex more for the plus move than the minus move sentences across subjects also did a little bit better on answering the comprehension questions for the plus move sentences, which was kind of interesting. Okay, um, so one question that came up for us is whether language is a special case. Um, so is it that language is kind of this great invader of cortical territory and there's some, or maybe there's some special relationship between vision and language. Vision um, is hierarchical, maybe language is hierarchical. You kind of have to work to make it happen, but people have suggested this idea. Maybe there's something special there. Um, or is this an example of a more general phenomenon where visual cortex is taking on higher cognitive functions? Um, so I'm going to present you with some evidence that this is a more general phenomena. So um, this, in this study, we looked at um, the neural um, responses to people doing a numerical task, right? So people, it, it has previously been shown that the intraparietal sulcus um, in sighted individuals is involved in processing numerical information. So for example, it responds more when people do math equations than when they listen to sentences. It also responds to various numerical estimation tasks, like when you show people a bunch of red dots and a bunch of blue dots and say, are there more red dots than blue dots? Um, so we wanted to know, um, in blind individuals, what are the neural mechanisms that support this kind of numerical reasoning? And we also thought that um, if uh, the visual cortex is assuming higher cognitive functions in general, and in particular if connectivity with parietal cortex and the frontal lobe is driving this plasticity, then we might find numerical functions in the visual cortex in addition to language. Um, so we had participants um, hear pairs of math equations, like 7 minus 2 equals x, 9 minus 5 equals x, and they had to say whether the value of x was the same across the two equations. And in a control task, they would get an active sentence and a passive sentence, and they had to say whether they meant the same thing. Um, so these are data comparing the responses to the numerical task with the responses to the sentence task. So in sighted individuals, you get this really beautiful activation in the intraparietal sulcus, which is the, a replication of various other um, studies before us. Um, but in blind people, you get that activation, so the intraparietal sulcus. Also, you get responses in the visual cortex. You see that in blind subjects, we're finding um, effects in the frontal lobe. In fact, the sighted people also show these frontal lobe responses just at a lower threshold. So there's no difference in the frontal lobe between the sighted and the blind subjects. Um, and if you compare the groups directly to each other, what you find is that the blind individuals are activating visual cortex during this numerical task. What's most interesting um, is the particular response of the visual cortex. So we actually had four levels of difficulty of these math equations, and the way we made them harder is that we either made the numbers bigger or um, we moved the x. So it's easier to solve 7 minus 2 equals x than x minus 2 equals 7, okay? Um, and this creates four levels of difficulty. Um, and so we, we wanted to know whether the visual cortex is sensitive to the difficulty of math equations. So the first thing to say is that the intraparietal sulcus is sensitive to the difficulty of math equations. It responds most to the hardest math equations and least to the least hard. And this is the same in blind and sighted individuals. So just as we saw with language, there's nothing missing in the brains of blind individuals. They have all the machinery that everybody else has. Um, 
In the visual cortex, the story is different. So blind individuals' um, visual system is responding most to the difficult equations and least to the non-difficult, the simplest equations. And this is not true in the sighted subjects. Okay? And there's a group by condition interaction. And again, as we saw with the language data, there's um, a relationship between um, how accurate participants are, um, in particular, or how much more accurate they are um, on the, uh, in, on the, sorry, how much less accurate they are on the hard trials and the easy trials, with the amount of visual cortex difference between the hard trials and the easy trials. So it seems like the amount of visual cortex plasticity is relating to behavior. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to bring up this slide quickly to make the following point, which is the visual cortex of blind individuals is not activating willy-nilly for all things, which is um, something that people have suggested. Maybe this unused part of the brain just activates all the time. Different parts of the visual cortex in blind individuals seem to do different things. So in this language responsive part shown in, um, on the right, um, uh, I'm showing you that that part responds to sentences and it responds to the grammatical complexity of sentences. So that's the dark purple condition relative to the light purple condition. Whereas in the math responsive part of visual cortex, um, in the occipital pole responds to the complexity of math equations, but not the complexity of sentences. That's, um, this is just showing a similar dissociation, but within V1. So V1 appears to have math responsive and language responsive components in a blind person. OK. So why is this happening? Um, why is the visual cortex taking on these higher cognitive functions? I've hinted all along that maybe this has something to do with connectivity, and now I'm going to give you a little, some evidence for that. Um, so one of the things that you can do to study connectivity um, is use uh, resting state data, right? So we're going to ask um, these visual cortex areas that in blind people are responding to these tasks, um, what are they correlated with, even when a blind person is not doing anything? Um, and these kinds of resting state data, so the person's in the scanner for 10 minutes doing nothing, um, you can seed a brain region and say, what are the things that are co-activating with this part of the brain? And resting state connectivity, um, it's related to anatomical connectivity, but it can also be different from it. So what this suggests is there's a functional coupling. It doesn't necessarily tell you that there's a direct anatomical connection. It's more about the functional coupling of these two brain regions. Um, and so one of the things we asked was, um, what are these visual areas correlated with? And so here's how we went about it. Um, so the first thing that we did, uh, well, it's not quite the order that we did it, but I'll just tell you logically how it goes. Um, so in the number case, um, one of the things we can do is take the intraparietal sulcus and use that as a seed in this kind of connectivity analysis. So we say, in a blind person, what is more correlated with the intraparietal sulcus than in a sighted person, OK? Um, so in, this is um, th that analysis. So in white, I'm showing you the seed region. Um, and this is a group, I can, in, a group difference, right? So the blue visual cortex area is more correlated with that white seed region in the blind group than in the sighted group, OK? Um, and you can seed, do the same thing for um, left inferior frontal cortex, which is involved in language processing, and say, what's more correlated with this area in the blind relative to the sighted? And you get a big chunk of visual cortex back. Um, so this is kind of interesting. And on the right, I'm showing you the functional responses to math and language um, in blind individuals, just to say that it's similar areas that seem to be correlated um, to have greater connectivity with the number and net language networks that in visual cortex are responding to number and language. Um, and one of the exciting things that we found recently, so just focus on the right side of this figure, which is showing connectivity, is that these connectivity patterns are selective within visual cortex. So what this figure is showing is math responsive visual cortex versus language responsive visual cortex, in this case in V1, how correlated it is with math responsive prefrontal cortex versus language responsive prefrontal cortex, okay? So what you see here is that math responsive visual cortex is more correlated with math responsive prefrontal cortex than language responsive visual cortex is with math responsive prefrontal cortex. And the opposite is true in the language responsive, um, in, in when you talk about language responsive prefrontal cortex. 
So basically what this means is that the language responsive areas in visual cortex are correlating with language prefrontal cortex, whereas in the math responsive visual areas are correlating with number responsive prefrontal cortex. So the function seems to follow the connectivity, or the connectivity follows the function, so that we don't know yet. Um, so I'm going to very, very quickly talk a little bit about some of the developed mechanisms, um, developmental mechanisms of this effect. We don't know very much about them, but um, there, we, do, we do have some information. So one key question is, is the brain this flexible throughout the lifespan, right? Is it just that your brain is actually gonna able to switch functions um, now, right? So if I just trained you for 10 years um, to have your eyes closed, for example, would your visual cortex start doing something else? Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do is ask whether these effects have a sensitive period. And to do that, we compared plasticity in individuals who are blind from birth versus those who became blind later in their life. So these um, in red are just the same data that I showed you before. Responses greater to congenitally blind, individual, and congenitally blind individuals to language than in sighted people. And now we're going to ask, what are congenitally blind individuals activating more than late blind individuals? Okay. Um, so the first thing is, when you compare late blind people to sighted people, you don't see actually any difference in this kind of task. There's nothing that they seem to be activating for language as compared to the people who are um, sighted. And then when we compare directly congenitally blind people to late blind people, you see this, the um, activation in yellow, which is the same visual cortex areas that the blind, congenitally blind subjects activate relative to the sighted. So this begins to suggest that there are sensitive period effects for these phenomena. I will say that um, this is a small sample, so there were only nine late blind participants in the study, and we're doing follow-up work to try to replicate and extend these findings. Um, this is just the same data, but in V1, showing that the responses to language are really um, pronounced in people who are congenitally blind, but not in people who are late blind, shown in green. Um, and one important point is that this does not seem to be predicted by the duration of blindness. So you might imagine somebody who's blind from birth is on average blind for a longer time than a person who becomes blind as an adult, but there are people who are going to be matched. So somebody who's 20 year, years old who became blind from birth is going to be blind for 20 years, whereas in a person who's 40 who became blind at 20 will also be blind for 20 years. And so when you take this into account, there's no effect of duration of blindness. Um, within the late blind sample. People who are blind for a longer time, it doesn't matter how long you've been blind, it's when you became blind that really matters. Okay, this last study in the next two minutes um, is a study we did with blind children to ask about when these effects become apparent. So when does the visual cortex of blind children start doing language? Um, and one of the questions we wanted to ask was, um, is language, are language responses in visual cortex related to braille learning? Because that's something that people have suggested. Maybe it's the first thing that happens is visual cortex response to braille and then language kind of comes along for the ride. Um, so in this study we had um, 19 um, early blind kids. Most of them are blind from birth. One child became blind when she was three. Um, and their ages varied a lot, so they were between 4 and 17, and we're going to look at those effects later. And then there was a sighted group of control kids um, and a group of sighted blindfolded kids. This was extremely interesting. Trying to blindfold a 4-year-old in the scanner is a task I do not wish upon anyone, but we managed. Um, so here we go. Okay. So these kids did um, a um, analogous task, task to the adults, but um, in a, a child-friendly task. So they would listen to a story, and they played a game called Does This Come Next? Um, and they would hear either the continuation of that story or some other story, and they had to say whether the continuation was right. And then there were two control conditions, a foreign language condition, where they heard stories in languages that they didn't understand, um, like Russian, Korean, and Hebrew. Not like There were three, Russian, Korean, and Hebrew. And they had to say whether the continuation was in the same language. And then in a music condition, they would hear a melody, and then they heard um, a sample of either that continuation of that same melody or a different one. Okay? And when things change, they really change. So it went from like a guitar to a drum. So very different. Um, these are the behavioral data. I'm not going to dwell on them. There's not a lot of important things here, except to say that the blind kids in the study are performing the same as the sighted children, right? So these are kids that are, 
you know, we did some testing with them using the Woodcock-Johnson um, Braille version of the Woodcock-Johnson test. So that gives us um, evidence that these kids are cognitively similar, and also their performance um, on the task in the scanner is indistinguishable from the sighted kids. Okay. So these are date responses to stories greater than music um, in sighted and blind children. Sighted children are shown in blue and blind children in red. And you can see there's a lot of overlap. Um, but one important thing is um, kind of in red over there, you see there's some extension into the visual cortex um, in the blind children, but not the sighted children. And this is the group by condition interaction, that comparison of blind kids versus sighted kids. And you see a bunch of visual areas crop, crop up in the lateral occipital cortex um, and also in parts of V1. Um, and this is that Braille question that I was telling you about. So um, the four-year-olds in our study don't know Braille, right? So they, they're not, based on the Woodcock-Johnson testing, they can't read. They, they don't even know their letters, um, so they can't read Braille yet. Whereas in the 17-year-old is obviously, a, well, not obviously, but she's a proficient Braille reader, an adult-level Braille reader. Um, but the visual cortex responses to language don't correlate with Braille proficiency. So it doesn't matter how proficient you are, um, you're just gonna have the same amount of visual cortex response to language, to spoken language. Um, and these are data from region of interest analysis to show that already in these young kids, you're getting responses that are selective to language in the visual cortex. So higher responses to language, than to foreign speech, and then to music. Um, so in orange is the data from the blind kids, and in blue I'm showing you the data from the sighted kids and the sighted blindfolded kids. Interestingly, blindfolding does have an effect um, on the activity of sighted children, but it doesn't induce a language response, right? So in V1, um, blindfolding removes the deactivation effect that we see in this task in the sighted children. Okay, so now I'm going to quickly conclu conclude. Um, so visual cortex seems to be sensitive to high-level linguistic information, including syntax, which I think is remarkable since we think both vision and syntax are in their own right extremely special. But nevertheless, it seems like the same part of the brain can be involved in both. Um, visual cortex, other regions of visual cortex are sensitive to symbolic number. Um, within cor visual cortex of blind individuals, there's some specialization for language as opposed to number. Um, and there's co increased connectivity between visual cortex and higher cognitive areas. And that connectivity is itself specialized. So it seems to be related to the specialization of the visual cortex for different higher cognitive functions. Um, and so what the developmental data suggests is that this is a phenomenon unique to development. So while during development, the brain regions are specializing, that's when the experience really has an opportunity to change their function, where um, it's happening during development and it's restricted to that time window, whereas in later on, a brain region seems to have a more stable function. So just to kind of overarching conclude um, the talk, uh, I think what we've learned so far from these studies um, of language and higher cognition individuals who are blind is first that concepts are resilient to um, dramatic changes in first-hand sensory experience. So even if you learn um, all your conceptual information without vision, even concepts that seem extremely visual to us, like sparkle, um, are preserved, uh, both cognitively, and um, there's a little bit less evidence for this, but I think um, nevertheless, neurally, there's some evidence for as well. Um, I think at the same time, these studies suggest that human cortex is highly cognitively flexible. It can take on a wide range of cognitive functions depending on the input that it receives during development. Um, and input during development plays a major role in shaping the cognitive function of cortex. And that's it, and I want to thank all the people who make this research possible. It's my lab um, at the top and some of my collaborators, Connor Lane, um, was my lab manager and is now a computer science student at Hopkins, and he did the syntactic complexity work. And Shipra Kanjulia um, is, was and is doing um, work on number in blind individuals. Um, and Judy Kim is also doing some work on language. She's actually um, now testing functional relevance using TMS, which is really important. And um, some of my collaborators are Lisa Feigenson and Akira Maki. Thank you.
up and use the microphone, whichever. Okay, so Okay, hello. Thank you for your presentation. I was really, really fascinated by it. I hope everyone can see me here. Um, so I was thinking, I mean, you know, I am deaf. I have a lot of, uh, you know, research for deaf, uh, deafness and captioning. I know you don't do a lot of um, research for deaf blind, correct? Um, but for me, you know, the brain of a deaf person, language, language ac ac acquisition visually and using hands for, for communication, um, it seems, you know, similar to, you know, rapid eye movement, REM, how it's related to sleep. I wonder if REM, um, if, if it's almost like, the, I don't know, the brain kind of, it's almost like the brain is cleaning itself in the evening. I wonder if there's some type of function for that and language for um, the individuals that you studied. And I wonder if um, touch, like, you know, just tactile um, experiences, does, do that help, does that help blind individuals learn, um, you know, term, uh, learn vocabulary visually? Right. So I'll go back to my seat. Right, right. Um, so you're asking a bunch of interesting questions. Um, I'm going to try to say a few different things. Um, so one of the things that I don't know that much about, but actually certainly true, is that sleep plays a big role in plasticity. Um, and there's the biggest evidence for this comes from animal work um, in mice showing that if you deprive mice of sleep, then you see less plasticity and less reorganization given the same experience than if not. I don't know how these effects that we're studying are related to sleep or not, but there's certainly a possibility that sleep is, plays a role in consolidating some of these effects, so I think that's very true. Um, I think the other thing that you're asking um, is, first of all, how, so we, what I've told you is that a blind person learns these word meanings, but I haven't said how, right? So how does a blind person know what sparkling means or what stare means? Um, and there's various ideas that one could consider. Um, one idea is um, language, right? So language has a lot of information, um, and we can use linguistic context to infer the meanings of words. So we can infer that when somebody says, I stared at it for a long time, that maybe that's a you know, an event that took a long time. So there's potentially language plays a role. Another thing that you raised is other modalities, which is certainly possible. So although um, the meanings of visual verbs are in some ways unique onto themselves, there's a bunch of their components that actually are shared across modalities. So for example, taking a long time is not unique to vision. You can take a long time with sound. You can be more, you can have a louder sound or a quieter sound. Similarly, you can have a brighter light or a less bright light. So certainly one possibility is that you're using analogies from other um, sensory modalities. But then on the other hand, um, intensity is not necessarily just a sensory thing. It's just a general cognitive way that humans think about things as being more or less intense. Um, but I think certainly those are viable, viable possible explanations for how a blind person arrives at this, um, at this information. Um, and, you know, certainly we know that um, tactile exploration for blind children plays a role in learning about, in learning about the environment. Um, for, for sure, there's evidence for, for that from studies with blind kids. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a very elegant talk. Um, my question is, you didn't speak so much about the other brain areas that are also active. And so my question is, is the observation in early visual cortex a replication of other functional activity that's going on elsewhere? And how critical is it? So it could just be a copy going to yes. V1 of all the other activity from elsewhere. Yes. And so if you were to interfere with V1 with a I don't know, using TMS or something, do you think the behavior would be influenced or diminished? Right, so um, 
So that's a great question, a really good question. Um, so great that I just wrote a grant asking for some money to answer that question. <laughs> um, but so uh, there is already some evidence. So, so first I'm gonna like repeat your question and talk about it a little bit, which is one of the things I've shown you so far, which has also puzzled uh, us, is, or, or not puzzled, it just is a fact, that one of the tools we've been using is saying, look, the visual cortex is responding like Broca's area. And that's a useful tool to say, wow, it's showing a similar functional profile. But of course, a problem with that is to say, is it just recapitulating the same thing? Um, and are there cases where the visual cortex might be doing something that's related to higher cognition, but it's different from anything else? And we're exploring that right now in other cognitive domains. I don't have an answer about that yet, um, but when, if, once we do, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but there, there are multiple things we want to know. The TMS, I think, is the most direct way to address that question. So there is some evidence already that TMS impair, to the visual cortex impairs performance in people who are blind. So um, the most directly relevant studies are studies on reading Braille. And there's also a verb generation study by Amira Mehdi. Um, so people have shown that if you stimulate V1 while blind people are reading Braille, you can induce errors in the reading of the words. Um, it's also the case that if blind people get a noun, like cat, and they have to generate a verb, like say an action, like meow, you can induce errors in that kind of task by stimulating the, the visual cortex of blind individuals. Now, um, verb generation is not language processing per se necessarily, right? So it doesn't show you that it's relevant for the parsing of sentences. And so we have a study right now that's like halfway complete um, where what we're trying to do is stimulate the visual cortex of blind people while they're doing the sentence comprehension task to see if we can make them worse by stimulating their visual system. But I do think that's a really important question, which is are these brain regions, what, what are they doing? Are they functionally relevant? I should say, you know, yeah, so it, the relationship to the behavior is really important. Another thing that we are interested in is whether the activation in this part of the brain contains information. So can you use multivoxel pattern analysis to decode things like the meanings of words or the grammatical um, category of a word that would give you some more um, evidence that they're actually representing something and not just co-activating. Thank you, yes. Um, my question is, was the same before, <laughs> because I think that is a fundamental question, but it's, a, I would say, a little related to it. Um, so for now, your study shows that um, our brain is extremely um, elastic, plastic, can change depending on um, uh, its experience. But do you think that your results can actually even influence the cognitive models that we currently have, for instance, in numerical cognition or for language uh, acquisition and understanding or language processing, uh, by either showing that in different, ex different um, exposures will lead to different models? Or do you think the models are the same, but they're just expressed differently in the brain? Right. Right, so I think that's a really, really interesting and important question. Um, so I, I would say that my current intuition is that the brain can solve the same cognitive problem in different neural ways. That you can implement, that to some degree the cognitive models are not a product of the brain piece, but rather a product of the cognitive domain that they're processing and of the network as a whole. Um, and, and for that reason, my um, intuition and, and all the evidence that I know of doesn't suggest that there's anything about the language system of a blind person or their numerical representations that's different um, from those of the sight of people. That this is really um, a different neural implementation. Um, and so what I think this, these kind of data are really telling us are that um, you can represent the same cognitive models. And so we should not think of brain regions as containing innately cognitive models because it seems like the same brain region can have very, very different cognitive models. Um, I will say that it, it is possible, though we don't know yet, um, that in some cases the visual cortex contributes something unique, right? The, the fact that 
it's being done in visual cortex changes something. We have not discovered anything like that yet, um, but I'll let you know if we do. So we're studying other kinds of domains, like we're looking at um, working memory um, and executive function, and we, there's some evidence that those kinds of tasks also activate the visual cortex in blind people, and whether that changes somehow the way that the task is cognitively being done, we don't know yet. So my question, you just, it was just really as regards to your last comment. So, so, so numeracy and language both are found to activate the visual cortex of blind people. So you've also said that that may be specifically possible because there are different higher order, order cognitive functions that are occupying visual cortex, so that that tissue is responsible for higher order cognitive function as well. Does that mean that there's any higher order cognitive functions that can be activated in the visual cortex? Like you just mentioned that you're starting to look at executive function. I was thinking maybe about working memory. Um, and those types of things. So could you elaborate on that a bit? Yes, absolutely. So um, the hypothesis, the kind of working hypothesis that I'm pursuing right now is that the visual cortex can do anything. Um, I think it will be equally interesting that I discover that it turns out it can't do everything. Um, there's some things that it really can't do. Um, as if we t turns out, that it, it seems like it can do a whole lot more than we expected it to be able to do, or at least um, the MRI data, the F functional fMRI data suggests that, that it can. Um, how far we can push it is not yet clear. So one of the, th the number um, effects that we saw are, to my knowledge, the first evidence that it's involved in anything other than language, right? So that's the first evidence expanding the results past responses to language. And so that starts to say, okay, well, this is not just a one-off phenomenon. Um, we're going to look at domain general cognitive functions like executive control and working memory, and it's possible that what we will find is it can do number and language and executive function, but not working memory maintenance. You just need those prefrontal neurons to do that kind of function. Um, but the question we're going to ask is, can it do those things too? Um, and one question that comes up when, when I talk about Um, so what is the systematicity? Why these different higher cognitive functions? And I think it has to do with input and connectivity. So people have talked um, recently about this idea that connectivity is really an important factor that determines function of a particular brain area. Whatever you're connected to, that's going to drive it. And I would say that, yes, that is true with the modification that connectivity does so because it drives input to that brain area. And the reason I think so is because the same region in a sighted person and a blind person can do very different things, even though it has relatively similar connectivity based on what we can tell from the anatomical data, right? Um, and so the reason I think this is happening in the visual cortex is because it has strong connectivity with higher cognitive networks, and in particular frontal parietal networks. So the thing that people thought originally was that and ha still think, um, is that when visual cortex shows plasticity, it's going to take on functions from the auditory cortex or from the somatosensory cortex. Um, but based on the connectivity, I think you would much more predict the higher cognitive effects because there's many more connections anatomically be between the visual cortex and higher cognitive networks than direct connections between the visual cortex and primary sensory areas, right? So that's what I think is causing this, these effects. And because the functional connectivity data that I was showing you before, it's possible that the way I presented it didn't make this clear. But basically, what we find is that the visual cortex of blind people is more correlated with frontal parietal networks in general. So frontal parietal systems for, are more correlated with the visual system in a blind person. And so to me, that provides a clue and maybe a hypothesis about what functions are going to end up in the visual cortex. And so my working hypothesis right now is that 
other frontal parietal functions are going to be there. And depending on which frontal parietal network is connected to that particular visual area, you're going to get a different higher cognitive function. So that's my working hypothesis right now. Last call for questions. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for honoring us with your visit and lecture. So, a round of applause.